Welcome to the Hunting Beast Report, a live video podcast with Dan Infault and host Jeremy Gillespie. Today's podcast is brought to you by Stealth Outdoors. The off season is a great time to rehab your gear, so head on over to Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com to pick up some climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, or stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Today's show is also made possible by Hunting Beast Gear, innovators in mobile hunting gear, and the designers of the Beast Sticks and Beast Stand. Check out the latest products at www.huntingbeastgear.com. And now, on to the podcast. All right, Dan, we are live. I did uh, Lou and Hunting Beast Gear ad. I've, I've had a problem cutting those off, so did not do that today. That's a good thing. What do you know today, Dan? Not much, man. How you been? Uh, good. Good. Got some news clips we're going to share today. So excited about that. Um, we'll get into one of those real quick here. But before we do that, uh, shout out to Uncle Lou at Stealth Outdoors for sponsoring the podcast. Want to let everyone know that he does have a sale going on. It was a two day sale. So yesterday and today you can get 40% off the medium rolls. So if you're trying to stealth some of your gear or maybe you got a new beast camera arm and you need some stealth strips for that, Head on over to Stealth Outdoors and check out the sale on the medium rolls, 40% off. So, Dan, uh, this week some some news came out from, I believe it was North American Whitetail. And I know you saw that. So, for people yeah. that didn't, we're going to share that clip here. And let's see if I can do that without messing it up. Okay, looks like we got the clip on the screen. I think I got the volume on. Let's see if we can uh, we can play this clip here, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. American Whitetail. We're here at the Iowa Deer Classic shooting big buck profiles. Folks, I had to show you this incredible typical. This is the new number three in the world, bigger than the Jordan buck, 207 and 7 eighths with 27 inches of brow ties. The Sam Iopa buck taken in Illinois 1991. It hung in his basement for 32 years. This is the first time the world has seen this incredible whitetail on display here in Iowa. So pretty incredible specimen there. Dan, what are your thoughts on that guy? Holy bro times, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> uh, in the clip, somebody in the chat too, if you could let me know if you could hear the audio on that, I'm not sure if my desktop audio will come through on the stream. So if you could hear yeah, the audio, yeah, it should be fine on yours, but I don't know, uh, if, it's going to come through for sure. So somebody let me know because we got a couple other clips. If it doesn't, I, I know what to fix. But um, okay. yeah, so the what else I said, the caption said 24 inches of brow tine and the guy that was uh, holding it said 27. So either way, either 12 or 13 and a half inch brow tines. But um, it's it's kind of unique or interesting that that buck was shot in 1991. And this is the first time it's public. So what are your what's your take on that? Yeah, it is pretty interesting. Uh you, you know, I give the guy the benefit of the doubt, um, but you got to wonder why why he never came forward. Um, and if it's even him coming forward, if it's not uh, one of his kids or something. Sure. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of people were saying that they thought uh, that times were different in the old days and people didn't bring things forward and stuff. And that's true, but not in 1991. I mean, right. that was about the time that the big antler boom went on. And anybody that saw a big antler would say something. I mean, uh, Right around that time frame is when North American Whitetail started chasing down, and all the magazines really started chasing down every trophy. Just for uh, for reference, I mean that's the time frame when I was shooting a lot of really big bucks, um, and there wasn't as many as there are now, per se. So um, in 1989, I shot a buck that was a little shy of 170, and it also had giant brow tines, but not no 27 inches. It had an 11 and a nine and three quarters bro tines. Um, and when I shot that buck, I didn't really say too much to anybody. Um, I just went and registered it and brought it home. And uh, just a couple of people that saw it, I had people coming over constantly from all over the place. Matter of fact, um, that's how I met um, the low life Andre Diaquisto. <laughs> he came all the way from Cudahy, Wisconsin to see it. Um, 
I'm it not, was like you I'm not familiar you with the geography. Do. How far of a drive would that have been? Oh, about uh, sixty miles. Okay. So, um, people would go all over the place, and you couldn't hide stuff like that. And you know, I understand though that some places could be geographically different, like farming communities or something. But most places you couldn't hide that stuff, and if you tried to, you'd be deemed a poacher, and they'd be trying to catch you and burn you because everybody shot big bucks was poachers back then now too you know like uh now i would be if i didn't film my deer you know sure uh, so now with cameras and stuff it's a little different but but it seems really bizarre but uh i was questioning it, whether it was legit or not and uh i made a phone call to um or i contacted uh gordon whittington who's a friend of mine and i wouldn't tell you this if he didn't tell me what he told me <laughs> because <laughs> i wouldn't want to sell him out Sure. But he, he told me that uh, he thinks it's legit. He said the story sounded good and uh, the and everything came together good. And I know he knows his stuff because before they put something in North American Whitetail, they're pretty careful about the information because they've been burned by a lot of people from poaching. But my point was um, a lot of people will say he didn't care about the rack size. He didn't care about if it was worth money or not, or, you know, he just hung it on the wall. Maybe that's the case. He didn't, he didn't even mount it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time from, it's hard to believe nobody that knew what that deer was saw it because yeah, a deer like that yeah. usually have a friend that comes over and that friend knows a friend that's a scorer or whatever. And, you know, things get out like, especially a deer of that caliber. Right, that buck uh, at the time frame, it would have been a world record, wouldn't it? Have? Uh, it beat the Jordan buck. Yeah, it beat the Jordan buck, and what? And it's a, just a matter of when Milo's came in. I think Milo know? shot it in '93, so it would have been two years before that. So, yeah, I think you're right. So it would have been the world record. So that buck would have been a million dollar paycheck for that guy. Crazy. At a time frame when a million dollars would have been a lot of money. Yeah. So um, the fact that uh he just didn't care about the money and didn't care about racks and didn't care about anything and thought it was garbage and who wants money you know just doesn't make sense to me yeah um but i do have the i i can believe he didn't know what he had but it's hard to believe he didn't show it to somebody who did know what he had yeah that's a good you point know, um, but i mean you you think about it if, if you shot like a pen raised deer or something you, you know um Pictures get out, people will know and stuff. But if it sat in your garage for 30 years, then you could probably take it out and say you shot it. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I do take, um, I don't want anybody to think I'm talking negatively. I'm not. Because uh, I take Gordon Whitman's word for gold. And he works at North American Whitetail, right? Yeah, he can yeah. sniff out a Rampala for 50 miles. You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it's legit. Um, it just seems bizarre, the whole story. I, I can't wait for the story to come out. But, you know, I'm kind of, I hate to even say this, but I'm a little skeptical of the Jordan Buck uh, story. If you've ever heard that story, it sounds a little unreal. I, I don't mean, know the, the back, guy, I don't know much of the backstory on that one. Uh, the guy who shot the Jordan Buck claims he took it to a taxidermist, um, got it mounted, and uh, the taxidermist moved away. He never saw it again. He couldn't find the guy, couldn't get a hold of him. Um, claimed there was a fire or something i can't remember the whole story but something like 30 years down the road he saw it for sale at a rummage sale and bought his own buck back hmm. but there, yeah. i don't think there's any picture proof or anything that he shot he's the one who shot it it's just his say that he found the buck 30 years later at a garage sale and it just happens he remembers that that's his buck so that's that's just kind of a bizarre story too yeah, if it if it is uh, true, I don't know the backstory, but if that is true, given the caliber of that buck, I'd imagine there wouldn't be too many you could confuse it with, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I wonder if they uh, they said that that buck was official. So um, did they X-ray it already? Because uh, that's what they gave Ron Paula a thing that he had to have his buck X-rayed because they X-ray all top bucks. I doubt they x-rated at the Iowa Deer Classic. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I guess, yeah, if you – and this is something I, I would imagine wondering. they do panel score there. They probably have all the guys there to panel score it right there. Yeah, and it was just a skull plate, but I, I learned about this the last couple of years, and I didn't even know this was a thing. Dan, you probably do, and, and maybe everybody else does but me. But 
a lot of people, uh, if you've got like a broken tine, they do antler repair at taxidermists where right. they drill a right. hole in the tine and then they put a steel bar yeah. in it and then they epoxy yep. over it and guys color them in. And you can't tell the difference if somebody's good at it. So yeah, I'm assuming I mean, that's why you said that. Taxidermists do that. They'll, they'll create bucks. They don't even, it's not even like fixing one. They'll yeah. actually create them. Um, I used to know a guy in Milwaukee he used to make these huge racks out of deer antlers, like sheds and stuff. And he'd buy racks. And he'd make these world-class bucks, every one of them unique, and you couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. And um, as a matter of fact, I believe I heard a story about that about uh, that Rumpala buck that that guy did made made antlers like that too. Um, he was a taxidermist. Yeah. But uh, um, there was another buck uh, from the '90s. I can't remember the name of the guy, but the guy. Uh, the guy had a world record and it went crazy all over the magazines and stuff. And uh, then somebody came forward and had pictures of that buck. He had found it dead and he sold this guy the rack. And the buck was like a, uh, would have been like a number three at that time frame in the world. But this guy wanted the world record. So he sawed off all the drop tines and stuff and sanded them in and recolored them and stained them and stuff. And he fooled. Boone and Crockett. Wow. That's crazy. But he got <laughs> he got busted because somebody had a picture of it or something. Sure. Yeah. So people uh, I, I just think that like if, if that guy really shot the buck, there should probably be some pictures of it with him shot. He shot it. He's got pictures. I mean, you don't shoot a buck that size and don't snap a picture. Yeah, and like you said, a buck that caliber and, and the prices that Cabela's or Bass Pro or whoever's willing to pay some for something like that. It's uh anytime there's money involved, there's temptation involved, I think. Right. Well, we talked about some famous deer here, some new deer, but what we're going to talk about today is GPS studies and specifically MSU. So I've got a post here. Let me see if I can share this one. Uh, it's not that one. Here we go. So this is kind of the uh, origin of what we're going to talk about today spencer bracken's posted on the hunting beast forum and i don't know if i can scroll on this or yeah i can okay so this is from the uh msu deer lab mississippi state i believe deer lab and oh here we go the whole thing there and they were talking about uh bedding areas and basically they tracked one bucket it's a three-year-old buck and it had 41 different bedding sites and they said that this was uh, at the bottom here it says this buck is a representative example of the 60 bucks we studied for this analysis many of our bucks were 5.5 years or older this particular buck though uh, when we noted this dan reviewing it the one that they posted with the 41 different beds that was a three and a half year old buck so that was kind of the kickoff point for what we're going to talk about today why don't you read that middle paragraph the one that starts out with your so you're clearly not going to find where this buck's quote bed is he has many beds 41 of them during this time period to be exact and he has more distinct bedding areas than there are days elapsed by this video does he have his favorite bedding areas sure but he's more likely to be found bedding in another area than in his most used bedding area yeah i almost feel like they're targeting guys like us that hunt the way we do and I don't think they really got a good grasp of what beast hunting is all about or bed hunting is all about. Um, they've been making statements like you can't hunt a deer where he beds because it could be in any bed. And I think that's really going to be the gist of what we talk about today. Yeah. And I think uh, reading through, why don't I bring that up? It, it's, a, it's a longer study, but if anybody's interested in this stuff, the uh, MSU Deer Lab, they've got a lot of like published research studies and, and we got one of those here too be worth looking at real quick and this is i think this is the study this stuff came out of and it, it was pretty interesting so it's uh, a lot of charts a lot of graphs scientific research type stuff mm -hmm. but they they talk about um where's the one i wanted to look at here yeah so they talk about the distance uh, travel by month they talk about the rut phases and it's important to keep in mind i believe that all this is uh from study grounds in mississippi so sometimes they show the rut and it's like why is the rut in december and january you got to remember it's in the south 
and the ruts later there. Mm -hmm. So not exactly one-to-one. -one. But another thing that, and Dan, we talked about this offline a little bit, the uh, study, it's it's in like farm and ag land. It's not swamp and marsh. And, and there's some distinction there too about, you know, maybe mm -hmm. how often or how frequently a bed is favored. So I don't know, give me your overall thoughts on how you interpret, because I know you've read the study, how you interpreted what's in there. Well, um, see, they've got half empty glasses. I got a half full one. I saw distinct uh, patterns and I saw the same thing I seen on my studies, on my camera studies. So um, just for perspective, um, these guys are not bed hunting experts. They're scientists. They look at data, but yet they're giving perspective on how to hunt. You know what I mean? And when I say that, I, I don't mean that to, to demean anybody or anything, but if you play that clip of them talking, you got that uh, that one clip of where they talk about how he hunts the same spot over and over again? Uh, cool. Let's see. There's a couple clips. I, First I know clip we, of... we got that one, but let me see if this is the right one. I'm going to play this one, Dan, and let me know if this is the right one or not, but. Because we had this large source of variation, but enough sample size to categorize these behaviors, we were able to break out. Not he's talking about hunting. Find the one okay. where he's talking about hunting. It's the, the first video. There's only one clip in it. First one I sent you. Okay. Well, that was the first one, but we'll, we'll find it. Okay. Well, anyways, I'll just, I'll just say what he said. He said basically... It was at the beginning of, of the video. He was talking about his hunt that he had recently taken. And he said that uh, he hunted this uh, uh, well-managed ranch where they grow big bucks. And he said that uh, his method of hunting was to hunt the same spot where he knew that buck would move eventually. And he sat there for the whole, like, two weeks. And then at the end, when he hadn't seen that buck yet, he had to decide whether to move to a different tree stand or stay there. And the reason I was going to cl clip that, he ended up shooting the buck on like day 14 um, of hunting the same stand over and over again. And the reason that's an important clip is because it shows that they have no comprehension on the way we hunt or what we go through. But yet they're telling us how to hunt. When they What they should be doing is telling us the data. Where are you um, seeing this buck in the bed? You know, When are you seeing him feeding? When are you seeing him here? That radio color stuff is, is fascinating. When they get into hunting techniques, that's where they kind of lose me. I'm not hunting a 40 acre, 40,000 acre ranch and sitting in the same tree stand over and over again. So they lose me. I'm mobile going to the deer. But uh, some of this stuff, this, the studies show, like like what he said in that clip that, that Spencer posted. Uh, he said that uh, the buck had 41 bedding areas. Well, we all know they bed in multiple places. He said... They had some preferred ones, but what are the odds you're on a preferred one? And what are the odds out of all, one of 41 that he's there? Yeah. Well, if you know anything about the way we hunt, it's not a matter of, of just sitting in bedding areas or putting up permanent tree stands in bedding areas. It's a matter of knowing where they bed, what time frame they bed, doing the detective work and figuring that out, and moving them for the kill when they're there. And we talk all the time about these studies of, you know, bucks are in these areas for like a two-week period and you got to know which area they're in for that, that two weeks and uh my camera studies were real close to his now um we had uh, a camera on one bedding area this actually wasn't my camera this was a uh, um a friend's we had some that were submitted and some we did our own but he had a camera for two years on on a bed and he had one buck in there one specific buck we that we felt was an adult mature buck that bedded there. That buck bedded there, I think it was 14 times the first year and 16 times the second year out of the whole year. Yeah. 14 times and 16 times. And that's what this guy's saying. What are the odds out of the whole year if he's there 16 times that you're there the day he's there? Well, guess what? Um, like on the 16 times, nine of them were the same two week period. And the next year, you know, Seven of them were in that two-week period, the same two-week period as the year before. Guess what time frame I'd be there, and guess what my odds would be then? 
Right. But he's looking at like he's taking the you know not understanding that the Bucks been there at a certain time frame for a certain reason. But some of the stuff they're showing in some of the clips that I gave you show that they specifically do the same things year after year, even their traveling bucks. Because so they had two separate types of bucks. They said about 30%, so one out of three are bucks that have multiple areas. So they live two different areas. Part of the year they live here, part of the year they live here. They have two different home ranges. So they might be on a whole different farm for part of the year. But the next year they're in the same spot they were the year before at the same time frame. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too. Uh, I've talked about it before the, that Dwayne Diefenbach from Penn State, not MSU, but PSU, they do their own deer blog. And when I talked to him, he said the same thing that uh, a subset of the deer were travelers or they had distinct summer ranges and rut ranges. And, and sometimes they were three, four, six miles apart. And it looks like MSU is seeing the same thing. So interesting to see that that's a phenomenon across, you know, what Pennsylvania, the, the east and in the south there for the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. why, don't you, why don't you play one of those clips well while while we're talking about msu deer lab and glass half full and half empty i, I think we should play this one because this one's pretty funny so this was another thing from the the hunting bees farm <laughs> oh. yeah, Jeez. hey uh-oh here comes trouble <laughs> Where can then the ladies went out for a little stroll, huh? Walking around and talking things through. Keep a tight perimeter. Hi. Ron Burgundy, <laughs> the Channel 4 News Team. Where's your mommy? You back off, Eve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so shout out to, uh, I think that was Shane Parker for the. The funny video there we enjoyed that one good job shane uh yeah so let's get back into the clips dan i'm going to play the one that we started because that was uh, something we wanted to talk about so let me get back okay. to that one and we, we missed a few seconds so i'm gonna back it up here just a little bit going on so we were because we had this large source of variation but enough sample size to categorize these behaviors we we were able to break out two different personality types and one of them is the mobile buck and, and about a third of our bucks fit this general category of basically living in two places sometimes more than two but generally two home ranges two separate home ranges yeah so that's what you were talking about dan so two-thirds kind of live in one area and then another third they live in uh, two different areas, usually two distinct or two or more exactly. sometimes. And then let's go. We got we got one other clip here. Let's see if I can find that one. So we we take the the betting information from those uh, behavioral state figures, and uh, and then we can look at the the grouping of those locations and and really make it interesting when we put those uh, clusters of points onto an aerial photo and you can say, hey, oh my goodness, this is where this buck has been bedding down. Right. Yeah. So I remember, Steve, when I started tinkering with this, it was several years ago. And of course, Luke took it over and did a far greater job than you or I could do even together. I, I wasn't going to point that out, but <clears throat> but I, I remember. I think I was just looking at a weekend, maybe like a three day time period. But mm -hmm. it had always stuck in my head over the year. You know, twenty, thirty years of always hearing about quote a buck's bedroom and this one particular bedding bedding area that this buck was going to have a lot of affinity for. It's like, well, let's just let's just take a look, see if that's the case, and just in that couple days that I looked at that one particular buck, there were different bedding areas all within a several hundred acre area. And so then we, I guess, uh, Luke, what he did, this is again, just a single buck. This would be buck 277 over a seven day period. And you can just see all the different places that that buck chose to bed. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
Hey, Dan, I want to pause it right here. And uh, they're yeah, talking about idea. two things. They're talking about, first of all, a three-and-a-half-year-old buck. And second of all, this is December 20th to 26th, which in Mississippi, I believe, is in the rut. So uh, mm -hmm. I think I think everybody would agree that there's going to be more travel during the rut and more possible betting areas as the buck's going, you know, doe betting to doe betting. Yeah, uh, a couple of things I find interesting, though, is, is he's really kind of uh, – pushing the fact that, uh, you know, they don't bed in one spot. I don't think anybody that he's aiming his finger at thinks they bed in one spot. If they did, we'd kill a deer every year opening day. It's a matter of figuring out when they're betting, where they're betting. Like uh, uh, on his uh, one visit to the left, I mean, it looks like it's a north wind. He's betting in the, you know, on the edge of an opening, right? Right. N number two, I would look at that map and I'd right away, the first thing I would look at, is the bottom that field that cluster of trees down in the bottom that overlooked area in the middle where everybody else is going to the big woods up in the top right mm -hmm. and look at how many times he's been there this is uh seven days and he bedded there four five six seven times in seven days now beds you know they mul bed multiple times in a day down there because it's rut i'd be but, curious to know if that's a, a tall crop too if that's corn in that field or something where it's offering security too it may be, it may not. Um, probably is some sort of high grass or corn or something. Um, but my, my point is, is it's still, it's specific spots. And if you know those spots, you can hop around to them. And if you hunt one or two of them, he's less likely to go back to those spots and more likely to go to the other ones. Right. And you talk about that all the time, why it's important to know all the bedding areas on the property that you have access to, whether that's 40 acres or 4,000 acres. Because then once you burn one out, you're more likely to predict, you know, he's in one of the few remaining ones. Right. All right. And this is a little bit longer clip, but I think there's only two or three minutes. Dan, if you want me to stop it again, go ahead. But we'll pick it back up here. Nine, nine different spots over the, the seven days. And some of the places he only visited one time. So yeah. certainly not a big affinity or affinity for the Bucks bedroom in that case. That's right. That's right. And some of them were more regular and yeah. you know what striking to me bronson uh is out in the big ag field the prevalence of of you know the really the the most visited most regularly visited bedding sites are out in the dang ag field and right who would go out and i think i'll go hunt in that clump of woods out there in the middle of the field i mean I'd naturally, normally under normal circumstances, before I learned all this good information, I, I would have picked a, a spot on the edge of the field. Yeah. Well, I've been missing Cause uh, I think that's classic overlooked beast tactics, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, listen to him. He's going to, he would normally hunt field edges. That tells you how they hunt, right? Yeah. I mean, they're hunting managed deer, but what do we know about deer? You're right. This is classic. They're going to be in that spot that they're calling overlooked. It's not, I don't think anybody on this watching this is probably thinking that's overlooked. They've probably heard it so many times. You're thinking, well, that's the first place I'd go, you know? Um, but uh, the next thing he gets into is kind of cool too. But I mean, yeah, there's going to be spots he visits once or beds once in that week or whatever. But there's also spots he, he visits three or four different times. And, and I would actually, where they try to break that up, that little island down in the field. Yeah. Into three different spots. That's one spot. You're going to hunt the, the, the wood lines coming out of there. That's one bedding spot. He's moving around in there to the different beds, basically. That's one island, one spot he's bedding. That's yeah. Not I mean, you've talked about that so many times, but I think it's worth mentioning because we can see it here on the graphic is you've talked about how do you differentiate if it's a doe bedding or if it's a buck bedded for multiple wins or, or whatever. And, and that's a prime example, right? That's one buck bedded in close proximity, but different beds, you know, in a bedding right. area, not a one singular bed. All right. We'll pick it back up here. Out on, on the bedding sites. Let this is probably a little out of order, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget it, but I, I do want to get back to what you're referring to. And if, if you're on YouTube watching this, we're talking about that point at the, uh, the bottom of the screen that has four, two and one visits on it. But before I forget, Let's qualify this. This is not to say if you're in a different part of the country or your landscape is different, you could have different results. Mm -hmm. And specifically what I mean 
if you are in an, uh, and we said in the previous episode, this is a really cool landscape for deer because it's about a 50, 50 composition of forest and agriculture. If you're in a place that's 90% or more agriculture, there may be a great deal more site fidelity for bedding because of availability. Mm -hmm. There's just not a lot of options out there. So yeah, it's going to be very reliable. The, the other thing that we will get into in subsequent slides is there may be a lot of diversity in bedding just in this particular instance here because all of the cover is mediocre. So you could go in there as a manager and really make some top notch, some really good bedding and, and it might show that there's a greater number of visits or affinity for it. But that's a little bit of an aside and a qualifier, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah, so give me your thoughts on that, Dan, because a couple of interesting things there to me. So so um, if you watch their management video and you learn how to make bedding, you could make really good bedding, but deer would never find really good bedding. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a little bit funny. I, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but... Uh, I mean, literally, if you're telling me you can create a good bedding spot, but there's no way a deer is going to bed in a spot enough for you to hunt them, you're a little out there. I mean, you're literally, um, if if their assessment on how to hunt bedding was correct, um, I've pulled off a, a royal flush uh, um, like 42 times, according to my wall. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, what I heard is, and they talk about this more in the, the actual report, is they talk about preferred bedding areas and basically for lack of a better term they explain it a little different but stem count right so mm -hmm. obviously yep. thick stuff is more likely to be bedded in and they're talking about there that it's kind of uh not optimal bedding habitat and the way i hear that if i'm a beast person is when you talk about crossing off the 90 percent all those yep. areas there that are aren't bedded or got one visit that's the 90 percent stuff right 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 yeah. absolutely Okay, well, that's, uh, I think we got one more clip that we want to talk about. I think it's in that video. I'm just looking for the right time stamp here. Uh, should be 3840, hopefully. I think this is the right video. Dan, if this isn't the right one, let me know. I might have been on the wrong one here. Most wearables only Jeez, we got an ad. Come on, YouTube. Strength training. I'm trying to do a podcast here. Over a corridor, or in this case, a foraging corridor. Mm -hmm. And then you set up That's on the, the foraging now. corridor. So on their way to the plot, they're going to stop and browse, especially for a bow hunter. That's, that'd be a good place to uh, to capitalize. But yeah, yep. it'll work with a chainsaw. You can do that. Was that the clip, Dan, or is that in the other video? I don't think it is, but it was kind of interesting. I remember him saying that, uh, uh, like it was something remarkable, how uh, when the deer leave those beds, they're going to follow the tree lines to the, <laughs> to the woods or to the food. or uh, That's not the clip that we were looking for, though. Well, we're going to get the right one then here. Give me one second. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. I already had it queued up for the right timestamp. So right timestamp, wrong video. Let's try again. Yeah, and it, it's uh, fascinating, Steve, when you think about when uh, you started your career 100 years ago. It, it was closer to 80, but <laughs> okay. we won't split hairs. You and I both doing similar work uh, many, many, uh, several decades ago. No. You got to find There was me. one where that. Uh, <laughs> I know where it's at. It. It's you in the same video. Here, here, we're going to get that. We had 140 who became a superstar nationally, yeah. maybe even internationally. After we collared him, he spent the normal amount of time during the hunting season. And then after the hunting season, about March, late February, he started moving. We could see him moving on a daily basis. He got over to the edge of the Mississippi River, spent about a week there, right on the edge of the river, and then swam the river. This, this river is... Even you couldn't throw a rock across the Mississippi River at this stage. It's it's over a mile across at this point. It's you know, it's the second largest river in 
the world. So it was a big deal for him to swim. So he swam across and spent the spring and, and summer over in Louisiana. We, we identified where he was. We talked to a local conservation officer, got the guy's name. We communicated with the owner of the property. Uh, I think he even said he saw the buck, the collared buck on his property eating soybeans. And we thought, well, he's he's gone from our study. Well, not so much. The next, uh, let's see, August, he swam back and spent the, the fall and winter in Mississippi. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. Wonder if he's going to do it again. And the next spring, he swam the river again, spent the summer in Louisiana, came back. Now, we can't, uh, I try not to edit. All right, we'll stop there. Yeah. So, so that's a pretty good clip. So uh, the reason I wanted you to play that was because people talk about these mobile deer and you can't hunt them. But if you look, that deer repeats the same thing at the same time frame each year, comes back. Yeah. Now that was uh, um, that was what they call a mobile deer, and they said one out of one out of three of the deer that they collared is mobile, where where they did their study. But what you got to remember too is that this was the most extreme one. 18 miles was the most extreme they've ever seen. Um, and it's still, after going 18 miles and crossing the Mississippi, and if you've ever seen the Mississippi Which River, crazy. that's a feat. Yeah, that is a that's feat. crazy. It's amazing. And still make it back to the exact same spot, exact same area, exact same beds, exact same food, food sources, and repeat that year after year after year. So if you're in the time frame, you can hunt that deer. I mean, you might only have one window where the property you're at, he's there at that time frame. But that's where, it, I mean, this isn't an easy task to hunt these deer where they bed and live and, and feed. It is a hard task. Nobody's saying it's easy. But if you put the work and you put the effort in and, and you start to learn when that deer's in certain spots, you can do it. And you can do it on a regular basis like I do. Yeah, and what I think we're trying to portray here is not that you uh, are questioning gps deer collar data which you're certainly not right that's hard data. No, not at all i think i think these guys are great guys i think they're in very intelligent and really understand the data that they're uh, putting out there just I questioning think they lack is when they start giving hunting advice on, on a tactic they don't understand sure sure so yeah we want to make that real clear um and these are for anybody that hasn't looked at these either penn state or um msu these are really great studies and if you're into that sort of stuff, which not everybody is, that's uh, you can get a lot out of it. And but it's important to interpret it from a hunter's mindset or a hunting beast mindset. See how you can utilize it. And then Dan, we got one more uh, clip we're going to show from that video, shorter clip. And I think I got that one queued up now while we were talking here. Let's see. I said, well, why would you start at zero? No buck's going to have a zero acre home range. Well, that's just the category and but we we had i think there was one buck that had like a hundred acre annual home range i mean he talk about a home buddy yeah he he was just hardly moving we thought he was dead half the time because he uh he wasn't moving but that's just his behavioral pattern and then we've got this deer that swim the mississippi river mm -hmm. huge variation so that's something that we've talked about a lot too is uh individuality and dan your your big buck that you called up to on thanksgiving that yep. that buck probably fit the homebody example right yeah i i think so but that buck did move around a little bit too yeah um um basically i found that buck in july about a mile from there two years earlier tracked him back um through muddy fields to a wood lot and it looked like he lived there. There was tracks everywhere in there. I didn't really lock down the bedding because it was towards fall and I wanted to hunt it. But other people were seeing that buck and moved in on that wood lot and pounded it and that buck disappeared. But I knew he was in the area somewhere and started scouting and searching and ended up finding him down there. And I don't know if he just relocated down there or maybe he lived down there part of the time. But then at that time frame, you got to remember now this when a year later and now this buck is six or seven years old or whatever he's changing his patterns tightening them up as he gets older locked down in that area um but yeah that buck did lock down there i found his shed in the bed meaning he was there in you know january or february right i watched him there in september and uh, uh i seen him in august in there 
I seen him in November in there. I, you know, I seen him there all the time during hunting season. Yeah. And, uh, right up until when I shot him the next year, right in that same area, every time there was a, um, a westerly wind, he would be there. So that deer locked up like that. But, um, the reason I wanted to play that clip was because of the fact that they said that one of their test study deer lived in a hundred acre area and moved such little bits during a day that they thought that maybe that buck was dead until it moved further. Well, that means it was bedding in the same spot over and over again. Right. It had to be if it wasn't moving on the, on the data. Um, so it, it's interesting. It can go both ways. I mean, it does look like from some of their data, some deer would be very hard to hunt um, bed wise, but literally um, from the way these deer are nocturnal, um, there's three ways you can kill them. You can accidentally be close to his bedding. You can be on purpose close to his bedding, or you can get lucky on the day that he moves a lot during the day, during the rut. That's, that's it. I know, so, I, mean, I know where I'm placing my bet. Yeah, because they're only moving a short distance in daylight, so you have to be close to bedding. Um, that's all there is to it. And uh, even these guys, when they're hunting, I don't know if they don't realize that or, or what. I mean, I think they know the distance they move from the radio color and stuff outside of the rut. But yet they're saying, you know, it doesn't make sense to hunt beds. But they're really, they're really locking in on... It doesn't make sense to hunt specific beds, but if you listen to how they hunt, they put up a tree stand, leave it there and they go back and forth to cut shooting lanes. And you, you, you know, when they start talking about hunting, you, you can't even relate to that. We're so sneaky about how we get in on those bucks. It's a whole different ball game. We go in there and we hunt it once and try to get that timing, right? Yeah. And, and the uh, difference between highly pressured Midwest public and private land, you know, where the pressure is controlled, I think, your tactics are born out of a necessity, right? Because that that is the only way you have a chance a lot of times is to be sneaky, is to hunt a specific bed and play the odds. And, you know, through spring scouting, through running cameras annually, you build up uh, the knowledge, like you said, of when bucks are in certain areas. And and then it's never guaranteed. Of course, it's never guaranteed. Look how many times uh, even the best hunters from the beast go out every year and don't shoot a buck. But what it does is it ups your odds considerably on either a specific age class of buck or a specific buck that you're targeting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, uh, probably one out of four deer that I see is, is, um, maybe one out of five is, is three or older. I think other people see 30 small ones before they see a good one, you know? Right. Um, and I think it's specifically because of where and how I'm hunting where the smaller ones do move more, move more towards the food, the younger ones, not necessarily smaller, but younger. Yeah. And going back to the map where they had um, the seven visits in that one spot in the center of the ag field, if you've scouted that as an example, right. And you hunted and you, you figure out that that's what you would call either a primary bedding area or a, a bedding area that's hot during this two week period. And then you build up uh a catalog of those type of bedding areas. Now maybe you've got 10 or 20 of those, you know, your odds of running into a buck are, are exponentially higher. I feel like. Mm -hmm. So, um, a couple of years ago, um, I did a, a big camera study where I put out a bunch of cameras on bedding areas and stuff. And a lot of it failed because the cameras uh, kept going dead on me. Um, but I did learn a lot of stuff. And one of the things I learned is that, um, that I did, wasn't really that aware of was these bucks do not bed for long in one spot. They seem to stay in the bedding area, you know, like in a couple acre area, but they get up and shift around at different times of the day. And it kind of seems like it's when the sun starts moving and stuff and this starts heating things up and the winds start changing or the thermals start changing. But I'm not positive on that, but I think it has to do with what they can smell and sense. Yeah. And they'll just keep moving around. But, uh, that was one real key thing. And the other thing was that uh, uh, a couple of the camera studies had people go into the, the uh, focus area once or twice uh, during the season. And I did notice that some of the big bucks um, would shy away for a little bit, but then come back. 
um, where I thought they'd be gone longer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I noticed if, if, uh, I had interference two or three times, then the camera just went dead for the season, you know, as far as buck activity with mature bucks. But I'd noticed that you could get away with one or two movements. And, uh, that might sound like what I preach, but it's not what I preach is once you get in there, they know they're gone. So I think there is the opportunity that if the sign's good, a guy could get a second or third hunt out of it if he's careful about how he goes in, especially depending on exactly where the stand is and how your axis is and what trails you're crossing and stuff. Sure. Um, sure. But I do think that that's teaching that deer that it's a hunted spot. You, you know what I mean? But if you're after a certain specific animal, sometimes maybe you got to make a second move. Yeah, roll the dice one more time. Well, you know he's in there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, uh, let's get into some Q&A. Before we do that, I talked about it earlier, but since Lou is such a great supporter of the hunting beast and has helped me out a lot, the Stealth Outdoors have got a roll sale going on. Today is the last day. Uh, there are only a couple hours left, so if you're looking for medium stealth strip rolls, 40% off right now, head on over to stealthoutdoors.com. So let's see what we got for questions here. There was one about coffee. Uh, <laughs> Death Badger, Dan, can I get some free coffee, bro? I didn't. Were you doing a coffee for a while? I don't remember. Or, yeah, I'm not doing it anymore. Okay, so I, I actually uh, uh, I made all the arrangements and stuff, and, and worked out a, a really good deal to get coffee directly um, from the growers. And uh, last minute, um, they reneged the deal, saying that I was going to outsell them and steal their profits or something. It just yeah. got weird. Yeah. I know you got quite a few people that shipped you coffee too, right? After you talked about coffee. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. MPWNY Mobile Hunter ask, will the Beast Crew be attending the Sportsman's Expo Ohio this year? No. No. Mm -hmm. They didn't uh, offer me the same deal they did last year. So I, uh, I didn't want to go. I will be um, at the Wisconsin Dells show in a couple of weeks. That's a big one. That's a fun one. Anybody in the area should probably go to that. That's a pretty good time. Um, I'll be there the whole weekend. Um, and I will be at the um, mobile show in Kalamazoo. I think that's in July, isn't it? I think so, yeah. And uh, I think that's it for me for the year. And the Dell show, I think we talked about this, but if people weren't listening in the last week or the week before, you're going to have some of the new Beast camera arms in stock, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, JSB285 asks, how is that a typical question mark? And I think he's referring to the, the buck that came out of Illinois that we showed. So Because it had a drop oh, line. Um, because actually... Um, if you looked at the gross score, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was something like two thirty or something. Yeah, it was it was pretty high. I so I, those were deductions. Yeah. So if you if if that guy would have uh, did what I said that other guy did and sawed off the drop tines and sanded them, I'm right. gonna blow the world record away by quite a bit. I don't remember exactly, so don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure if. A deer has 15 inches or less of non-typical points. You can score it in the typical category, or you can score it as a typical, even if it's got more than that. But they just, like Dan said, everything's deducted. Right. So I, I mean, uh, it's really an unfair system that they got. If you ask me, the more antler, the better. I mean, um, if you didn't know anything about scoring, nothing at all. If you had no idea what scoring even was, and you went out right. hunting. What would you like better? Right. A clean, typical 150 class 10 pointer or that same clean, typical 150 class 10 pointer with two six inch drop tines? Yeah. Which one would you like? I if, think 99 if, out of 100 guys are going possible. for the drop tines. Right. But by uh, the scoring system, you'd be far better off to take a hammer and break off the drop tines. And literally, um, for score, there's probably been people that do that. If they think they got a world-class buck and it's on the ground and nobody's there yet, all they have to do is... If, literally, by rule, if you shoot it and it's running through a field and it stumbles to its death and breaks off that 12-inch drop tine and now it's the world record, 
That's fair. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the rules. So if it is on and it yeah. doesn't break off, then it's not the world record. Yeah, and it's it's called Boone and Crockett Club for a reason, right? Because it's rules by a club that they made up to judge deer based on their own standards. I mean, right? I'm not knocking them because that's their rules, their standards, their thing. It's just not necessarily mine. Yeah. I mean, if I shot the world record, I'd get it scored and I'd sell it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get that million bucks. <laughs> that's me. Yeah. I always like the saying, uh, "Nets are for fish." Right, net scores. I, I, that's for fish. I love all antlers. I mean, sure. um, a lot of people think I'm some sort of nut job who just is all about scores. So I don't care less about score. What I like is a mature buck, and every one of those mature buck has some unique stuff going on upstairs, and that's what I like. I like the uniqueness of every mature buck. I mean, I could get, I could take a, a, a seven pointer that scores one forty, and I'd be ecstatic. And I wouldn't care that it scores 140 because if you took seven points and put it on 140, it's obviously got some character. Yeah. You know? um, I got, I just got a seven pointer. That's 120, Dan. It's got six inch bases. <laughs> that's, that's a great buck. That's goofy. Yeah. When you get bucks that are, you know, especially when they get into that, like five to seven year old range, those are just every one of them. You're in awe. And yeah. if you're not, you probably shouldn't be in the sport. Yeah, because if you're in any state with decent hunting pressure, the odds of a buck getting to that age alone, pretty incredible. So, yeah, be glad for whatever it's wearing. Right. Uh, Uncle Lou says the next world record's coming from Michigan. Uncle Lou, I think you're a little off. I heard he's going to shoot it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. I know Uncle yeah. Lou's area, and I've, uh, I might have been in that area to hunt once or twice. I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that, Dan. Boone and Crockett better make sure that those uh, tines ain't stuck on there with stealth strips. Yeah. <laughs> a little more obvious than the Ron Polo buck. Uh, <laughs> Andy Howe says, what do you think about the Johnny King buck? Should it be the world record? I'm pretty sure Johnny King buck's got a common base point. I think that's the deal, right? Let me look it up it real does, quick. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a common base to me. It did right from the beginning. Yeah, I think so too. And again, that's a score thing, right? If it's a common base thing. Uh, mm -hmm. then, then it doesn't count according to, it counts for gross, but let me see. I think I got a picture of it here. Let me blow it up. Bear with me. This live stuff, right? Share Johnny King. No. Yep. So I think it's, uh, this time right here, yeah, right there where they yeah. meet. That's yeah. what they call a common base. Yeah, and Dan, why do you explain that for people that don't know what a common base is? I mean, it's pretty. So obvious. that means that the the intersection of those tines meet at the same place in the uh, beam, and it's uh, um, they're growing out of the same spot. So it's basically a fork coming off of the 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 uh, beam. It would need to be centered between the two tines on there, and uh, coming out of the main beam, not coming out of the same union as the other tine. Yeah, so they so essentially that's a non-typical point that counts against the score. Correct. Yeah. So that's a five point side with a uh with an extra non-typical time. Yeah. Like I said, the scoring system is not fair. I don't necessarily agree that that time should be deducted from the score. Awesome buck either way, right? Like you said, who cares? Mm -hmm. Shooting that one 11 yeah. times out of 10. Uh, Devin says, Dan and Jeremy, do you guys ever get into fishing during the off times of the deer season? Go ahead, Dan. Do you do any fishing? Uh, oh, very little. Uh, I, I like fishing. I go every now and then, but, uh, it's just hard because I, um, I spend just about all my, uh, free time searching for the next victim. Yeah, I do a little bit also in Michigan. I have a cousin that lived in the UP, so whatever the opener is, can't remember now, May 15th, June 1st, whatever it was. I'd usually make a trip or two up there every year to do some musky fishing on the Taquamina. That was always fun. Get some big northerns or some musky if we got lucky. And then out here, uh, Dan, maybe you've watched the Randy Newberg. They got paddlefish out here, which is a, a big, ugly fish with a bill. That's like a prehistoric thing. And I've got two tags for those. So I've got two paddlefish. That's pretty fun. If anybody ever gets a chance to do it, I recommend it. And Fun fact about paddlefish, it's a filter feeder, so they don't eat bait or anything, and the legal method to get them is to snag them. So you feel like you're doing something bad when you're paddle fishing out there with a big treble hook ripping it through the water. But it's a good time. So other than that, uh, not a ton of fishing for me either. When I was young, I used to like to uh, river fish for northerns. 
I'd go uh, back in the woods and stuff along um, big rivers and find uh, deep holes and bends and stuff and fish with suckers and stuff and catch big northerns. I, I used to love that. Yeah, pike, pike fight real good, so that's always a good time. Uh, let's see. Buck Slayer says, now that it's off season, do you replace – your stand and stick straps. How often are you replacing your straps? Uh, I take a look at everything once a year. So I'll take my stand and I'll uh, put it on a table. I'll take the strap off. I'll look. I'll look over a strap real well. I'll look at the buckle real well. I'll. Uh, I'll look every place a bolt goes into the stand. Uh, I'll make sure that they're they're at the right tightness. If uh, a nut's been tightened a few times, I'll throw the nut out and buy a new one. Put it on there. The locking nuts. Um, I will wax all the connections if, um, especially if I take them apart. Um, and I'll, I'll just check everything. I'll even look at the cables because you can get damaged to a cable. Um, and if you get water inside of the cable, it can rust. Um, but when you hunt mobile, usually those, those cables don't go bad so fast because you keep it in a garage or dry space. Um, yeah. But not out on the weather for days or squirrels chewing on your straps and stuff. Right. Yeah. But I, I would I would sug strongly suggest um, once a year, um, either after season or just before season, you go over your stand really well, all your sticks and stuff, and just make sure everything's tight. There's nothing creaking. There's you know everything's at the right uh, amount of movement. And what I mean by that is like uh, things aren't supposed to flop around. You know whether it's your uh, you, everything. I mean, even the platform, when you push it up, you yeah. just stay where you push it, but not be super hard to do. Right. You know what I not, mean? Bound, not bound up, but not free floating either. Yeah. Right. So that you can do things quietly and smoothly and effectively. So just make sure you got everything at that setting, you, you know, and uh, that there's nothing worn out or anything once a year. Yeah. And uh plug for the B sticks. I used to be constantly adjusting my original lone wolf sticks, right? With the flipper step and the and the moving yeah. standoffs and that's all gone away now which is nice so thanks dan uh let's see buck slayer we got another one what's dan's thought on spartan forges deer collar data and predictions for movement etc basically like their intel stuff yeah i i don't know much about the deer collar study stuff that they have on there uh their their ia or ai stuff um is pretty interesting um However, I don't find myself wanting to use it much just because I think I've already got that data up, upstairs. Dan um, is AI. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, it is interesting. I think it could help. The AI stuff, I think it could help somebody that's uh, new to hunting. Uh, yeah, when good. we talked to Bill, that's what it seemed like it was geared towards. And don't quote me on this, but I've got the impression that um, their prediction data, they were using things perhaps – not like, but maybe even the the studies from MSU, and I think I think they bought some of those data sets to to populate their model. Don't quote me on that, but that was what I think I heard Bill say. Yeah, uh, I love the I love the app. I mean, um, and by the way, if you, you don't know it, if you you weren't watching that show, um, we give you uh, thirty percent off for using code Beast if you buy the Spartan app, but you have to go on their website to buy it. Yeah, SpartanForge.ai. Um, you if you cannot get the discount if you direct download to your phone from the App Store, you got to purchase first through like a PC or desktop or whatever. Right, and you have to use code Beast. But uh, I love the app, um, which is why I agreed to to work with them, um, because I, I love the mapping and stuff that they have, um, and, and I, I really love Bill. He's a great guy. I like working with great people great apps um and just to make to, to make that lock down i get a lot of offers and i turn almost everything down i mean me and jeremy looked at a very lucrative um offer just the other day and we both collectively decided to turn it down because they had a very poor customer rating yeah um, but i mean um bill has a great product he's going big places and he's really going someplace with that uh app and i love that app and it's cheaper than uh, Onyx, and it's got better mapping. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I think uh, value of a lifetime. Personally, I've got really into the LiDAR stuff. Onyx doesn't offer that at all. Caltapo does, but then you're doing a bunch of stuff, and you can't use 
Cal Topo in the field, at least not easily. So I would pay double what Onyx charges just to have LIDAR. So that's a huge mm -hmm. thing and, and a big benefit of Spartan Forge, in my opinion. Uh, Dan, Jimmy Gammon says MSU is going to try to collar Dan. So <laughs> you're next on the study. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how well that would sell. Maybe I should collar <laughs> Maybe I should do a collared study and everybody can try to figure out where I was on. Well, he stayed in one spot for a long time. He was either hunting or pooping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that'd probably go over well. Uh, JSB285 says, will mature bucks only bed in a thick area with a terrain feature or would they bed in an area that is just plain large and brushy? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a there, there is a point of too thick. And there is a point of, uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to say it's because it's brushing stuff, but they're going to bed in a spot for specific reasons. And when I say that, um, what I'm saying is they need, need, need certain ingredients. They need to be, you know, one of them might be vision, but they still have to be able to hide their body if they're in an open enough place to see. So they'll put themselves up against something thick looking out, or they'll put themselves up against a tree or a deadfall. But, uh, they don't typically bed in like open mature forests, not unless there's nothing else available. Um, they're almost always on some sort of thick edge or they, they've got, they've usually into something somewhat medium thick, but it's, I think you're more likely to find them on the edge of that than in the middle of it, of the thick stuff. And if it gets so thick that they can't bust through it, if they're, uh, if somebody comes after them or an animal or a wolf comes after them or something, um, they, they, they got to be able to escape. So, uh, yeah, it's usually thick cover. Yeah. And I, I would say just to piggyback off what you said, Dan, usually the reason you're focusing, even in the swamps, it's like a bowl or a point it's, it's thick, but it gives a secondary advantage too. where uh, on a point, something can only generally approach from one way or on a bowl, you got, swirling winds where they can scent the area better so it's not it's one of those things where it's not always or never right they could just be in a thick area but more often than not it's it's got a train feature also that's that's a very good point because um we did workshops over the weekend and uh that was um surprisingly to me it was one of the biggest topics people really wanted to know why deer were choosing dan's points and not just randomly anywhere along the thick transition and my point was, was, you know, like a point going down into a cattail marsh, where's your danger going to come from? Yeah. It's going to come right down that land mass, right? Whether it's a coyote, whether it's a person, no matter what it is, 99% of the time, it's going to come right down that point. So they can sit at the tip of that point and monitor if something's coming at them. So these spots that they pick are all set up so that if you try to get at them, they'll catch you before you get to them, basically. Yeah. Uh, really, the best way to get good at understanding that is not to listen to me jumble about it, but to actually go out and look at beds. And when you find good buck beds, there's a, often a, a, like a wow, you, you know, you know, like a wow. This, is, how would you get near this thing? Because they set up so accurately. So, uh, yeah, it's more about just taking the best piece piece of land and and. Uh, being able to uh, monitor somebody coming at them so that the features that they pick are usually features that lead danger to them from a certain way, which is why you find them watching a trail a lot, like bedding on a hill, watching a trail, because that's their thing is to watch for the danger, you know? Um, you know, MSU, uh, one of the things that they were saying that, that, that I kind of liked was that, uh, you know, like when you take, you know, it's 90% wooded, and and thick there's a lot more bedding and if you have the same number of deer good luck trying to find the right bed right yeah. but if you get something that's 95 percent open and there's seven places they can bed and you have the same number of deer and maybe it's three well, there's a much higher likelihood during the beds right i know um when i hunted in um in open terrain in uh western iowa far western like zone four out in farm country, there was very little woods. And I was kind of shocked when I went down there. I'm like, there's a lot of big bucks around here. And there were. But just about any good woodlot that looked like it was isolated and nobody's going by it, 
when you watch it in the evening, deer come out of it, and usually some good bucks. Just about every one of them that you could dictate was betting would have have good bucks coming out of it. And it was because there's very little places for them to bet. So a lot of it is dictated by the terrain you're on and, and what they have available. Some places are just downright harder to hunt. Yeah. Yep. When there's not as many options, uh, narrows it down. I think it's one of the reasons the plain states are, it's fun, but it's also challenging because if you're not in an area like Iowa with a hard, high deer population, there's less habitat, but there's also less deer. So then that's a whole nother challenge there. Uh, Bill Whitaker says, I'm a park ranger in an OHV park. Our park is 2,000 acres. When I work in the woods all year, am I destroying my chances of getting a three-year-old buck? Or will they learn to tolerate me? Uh, I think I think what's going to happen is you're going to learn the woods real well. <laughs> so yeah. um, I, don't, I think I wouldn't go and hunt someplace right where I just worked. But, I, I you know, as long as you... I think it's actually an advantage because you know where the park ranger worked. <laughs> you yeah. know what's been disturbed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a disadvantage if you're working right where you're going to hunt. Yeah, but I think uh, a lot of these deer were shooting, like in bedding areas and stuff. Honest to God, I mean, I'm, I'm hunting, in some cases, 75 yards from the main human axis, and people are walking past me not knowing I'm there while I'm hunting. And I'm shooting some of the biggest bucks on the property. So you can be just off of where you work, too. Those deer will kind of learn. You, you, you know, deer are different. Like, like say, bears. When we hunt bears, they want to be as far away from a person as possible. They, they just want to get away from humans. They're afraid of humans. Deer aren't like that. They'll live in your backyard. Yeah. They'll live on five acres. As long as that, uh, you, know, you know, 500 yards away where you move all the time. You don't come over by that five acres. So I think it's an advantage um, to be out there all the time, not a disadvantage. Yeah. No, good point. I'd, I'd agree with all that. Uh, hunting Factor says, scouted a bedding area which had fresh rubs on one side and older ones on the other. Does that mean bucks visit that area pre-rut and rut, or is it just multiple bucks at different times or, or something else? So he's talking there's... Uh, two distinct different classes of rubs sounds like it yeah fresh, and, yeah, yeah fresh deer. ones on what would be maybe an entrance or an exit and then older ones on the opposite side yeah it's probably two different time frames under there is what i would say i mean i've got spots like that i've got spots that uh, have that two week window in early season if there's acorns dropping it's really good and then they have another two week window that's good every year during rut in the same bedding area you know, and you got other ones where it's only good during the two weeks during the rut or only good during acorn dropping years. And, you know, so a uh, good chance if he's got that distinct of a difference between the ages of the rubs and they're from the same year or the same season in the same bedding area, he's probably got a spot where they bed at two different distinct times. And there are some bedding areas that are really good that have bedding all year. We call them... Um, uh primary beds primary bedding yeah. yeah um where they'll bet all year but even in primary bedding you get distinct time frames when they're better um but those ones will have rubs from the whole entire year usually the bedding areas that are really ripped up with rubs are usually like pre-rut bedding because that's when they're really aggressive and that's when they're rubbing the most sometimes yeah. your early season bedding areas will only have one or two rubs or not even have any yeah, like the velvet shed yeah. rubs, even if it's a big buck, a lot of times it's a real, like, I don't know, for lack of a better term, weak looking rub, but it'll it'll often still be higher. So, like, that's a good way to pick it out. Yeah, another thing, too, um, you know, what we found over over the years was that uh, some of these bedding areas would really look good and be ripped up like crazy with rubs. And you find out it's all two year olds. The bigger bucks, there would be less rubbing. And I think the reason is, is because when you get on the public land, there's not as many big bucks. Right. There's not as many, you know, five, six, seven year old bucks. And usually we struggle to find a property that has one of those, you know, and that's the property we're going to focus on. So they don't really have to compete with other deer. So their bed areas often have very little rubbing. But when you see a rub, it's usually a high rub, you know, on a bigger tree, 
and it's you know it gives a little more away that way but the rubs that are in bedding areas are generally competition rubs against other bucks so when it's tore up a lot of times it's like medium age bugs bucks where there's more of them competing for something you know um because two-year-olds can really rip up some trees you know? yeah like you said like teenage teenage actually, trees, right exactly exactly yeah. Let's do one or two more. Dan, Steve Bishop says, Dan, how often are your setups just off wind and your wind is at their exit trail with your shot being right before the buck hits your scent trail? I would say that happens pretty often. Um, I don't really worry about spooking deer after they leave. I worry about killing them, you know. Um, and generally, not a lot of deer come out of these bedding areas because they're usually competitive. It's usually one or two. Uh, if it's two, you got something to worry about, but it's usually, usually it's one buck. It's either the target or nothing, right. you know, or it's, it's a smaller buck only. If he spooks, so what? I don't really intend to come back if that's what's bedding there. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And well, think, not that you're advocating hunting field edges. I know you're not totally against it sometimes, but if you're hunting just off winds, you almost need a setup like that where you know you're you're not going to have a bunch of deer come by because that, that doesn't end well. Right. So you know, I hunt the most where I'm just off wind is in hill country. Because if you hunt hill country from above, those bucks are almost always bedding on that leeward side. And they're bedding on those points. And the wind's blowing on that point. And for you to hunt above and they're coming up to the fields, you have to hunt on a just off wind. So then I'm trying to take, you know, whichever side the wind's teetering towards and get off to the side, you know. Um, but when you get into uh, marshes and swamps, um, most of the bedding is not wind specific. It's more about the sound of you coming through the water and the brush to them and stuff. So you can hunt with the wind to your face in swamps and stuff, you know, you know, most often, um, even in hill country, you can do that. I mean, they don't, they don't have no qualms about getting up and going straight with the wind. Um, but I'm just saying if they're going uphill, you need that just off wind because the wind's going to be blowing down the hill. And a lot of places, that's what you got. You're hunting tops. You know, if you're hunting bottoms, then you can get away with it, but the bottoms get that thermal, you know? So in a lot of cases, people are hunting tops in hill country. So they are hunting a just off wind. No, it's a good distinction. Yeah. When it's kind of a more ideal tactic for a certain terrain. Uh, let's last one, Dan, um, or last one for tonight. If we didn't get to your question, join next week. Uh, we don't always have time to get to every question, but we try to. So just come back next week and ask again. We'll, we'll try to get to him. Mike says, what type of habitat do you think is most likely to produce old bucks five and a half years or older? Um, vast, um, nastiness. <laughs> so like but where I live, um, Places that have, you know, a square mile of cattails in the middle of them that were that actually have bedding in the cattails, um, like high, high ground in the cattails, uh, um, patches of dogwood out there, uh, real small islands that you couldn't get on and hunt if the deer is bedded adjacent to it. And the reason those places have the biggest bucks is because they just get the age class because gun hunters can't kill them all. They can't come through there and kill everything that's got a rack. They can't do drives. They can't, you know. So those places are usually the best places for big bucks. Um, when you get into um, other habitats, um, it can be you can you can go through a lot of places that are just wooded or uh, farms farm type properties that are public that have just guys will hit every section of it, you know, and it's hard to get in that grows older than you know two years old yeah and along the same lines um for different but the same reasons i'm thinking of a state like pennsylvania and even though it's a lower deer density you got more guys now hunting the the mountains and far back in the mountains with where there's difficult access for the same reasons as the swamp right because you can't drive it out it's not getting as much pressure it's it's remote and it's allowing some of those deer to get older and bigger yeah people are getting more remote now i mean um Onyx took away a lot of the fears of getting lost and stuff. I mean, yeah. it gave people um, 
excuse my language, but the balls to, to do it. Um, a lot of people used to just fear coming out in the dark and not knowing how to find their truck. You know, I don't think a lot of people even know how or carry a compass anymore, but they all carry a phone. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, all we had for today. I hope everyone show, enjoyed the show. Pretty a lot more tactical today, and we're going to try to start incorporating some more clips and news, fun to do, and uh, like that big buck out of Illinois and, and the stuff from MSU Deer Lab. Again, great work by those guys, just giving our twist on it. So turn it over to you, Dan, for any closing words. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us today. I think it was a fun show. I think this was a pretty good one. Good stuff to discuss. All right. Well, thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks for all the questions. We'll catch you next week, seven central.